So how's everyone? Um, are you waiting for the next coffee to wake up or are you wake up? Who's awake? Like really awake? Okay, everyone else, please get up. Do a little bit of wiggly waggly. And then you're allowed to sit down again. Thank you. Okay, for a start, I know it seems like a stupid question, but I need it. So who is a sort of, I just call everyone now, Agile coach, like could be Scrum Master, something like this, delivery, whatever, you know, those things. Uh, just hand up, you don't have to get up now. Great, perfect. Then a second question, how many sort of methods, uh, interventions, whatever you call them, things, tools, whatever you can do doing your work, you know, do you think it's more like 10? Who's for 10? You don't know what's coming. Oh, it's going 10, 50, 200. So who's for 10? Who has like 50 in his mind when working? Who's roughly about 200? Okay, I can also go for 1,000. Who's with 1,000? Okay, great. Okay, just to have a brief overview because that's really what it is about, right? So we are this sort of, I just call us all now agile coaches, whatever you are. Um, and it's really interesting. Yesterday evening, we were at the rooftop with those who wanted to have a drink together. And then it was closing down. So we said, like, let's go somewhere, you know. We tried to move the troops. And I'm really happy to be, have been part of that group yesterday because it really fits to my talk. So what was happening then? Someone is already laughing. He was part of it, I'm sure. Now I know. We went to that place, we had our speaker's dinner on the night before, we knew it's outside, it's a lot of space, you know, you can stand everywhere, drink a bottle, fine. We came there with about, I don't know, 40 people or so, and they were not ready to serve us. So my plan was to sit down, wait until Jose and JP come, we can organize ourselves, and also like 40 people sitting down, just sitting there, it will do something, right? So, well, in the end, it did something, um, especially because some um, very good guys would go in and bargain for bottles instead of like being served, really like having bottles. So we got a situation where we have a solution in the end, but at the same time, what happens is we have like part of the group already thinking like, oh, they don't serve us, we want to behave, we have to get up. I'm like, well, if they don't serve us, they didn't tell us we are not allowed to sit here. So let's wait and organize ourselves. Well, no, but the information that we have a solution here did not yet travel to everyone. So part of the group was like, we want to behave, we want to get, but I, you know, let's go somewhere else. I'm like, okay, they gave that information they had already to Jose, JP arriving, they won't serve us. Okay, good. So part of the group was moving, part was in the middle, not decided. The other part was sitting there like, like I'm not leaving, <laughs> like me. Um, interesting, what happens now? Um, so again, we are all sort of agile coaches, right? So just bear in mind, we have all those uh, five, 10 to 1,000 ideas in our head what to do in those situations. We go to the riverside, we try to find another spot with 40 people. And there's some of us trying to somehow bring the other ones together and you know, make them listen and so on. It <laughs> didn't work. Not really, right? <laughs> So we find a place, and it's astonishing. For, for me from Berlin, I would say if you want, had a place with 40 people, you don't leave because we will ne never find another place with 40 people again, right? So we find a second one where we see tables and like it's enough and we can like squeeze in and the guys come up with me and say like, I'm going to leave in some minutes. You can have the table, we change, you know, so no one else get the table. And it's really hard to bring the people together because some are saying like, okay, then I'm going home. The other ones say I need to something to eat. So they go to the restaurant. The, the other group is already up front. Some are sitting down already I'm like okay what's happening I'm like okay guys just let's go here and sit down and then we get our orders with a beer what happens everyone goes to line up for the order of the beer I'm like okay guys if you all stand there in line people are taking the tables I can't cover up for six tables at the same time can I <laughs> so so guess what how much did it help that we were all agile coaches having all those things in our mind It's also, I was like thinking, okay, how can be, and I'm, I'm sure that we are really having a lot of very intelligent, th thoughtful, I don't know, um, brilliant people there. It didn't help. We were as stupid as sheep at that group, okay? So, 
We even had like leaders, they were trying to be the leaders, but they, you know, were so loud, so that people wouldn't just hear you, you know. I'm good at that as well, usually, but no one would listen. So, okay, just as an example, that is exactly what I was wanting to talk about in my talk, because talking about my last two experiences, it's really hard in a complex and a, like bigger, it wasn't so complex and not so big, but, you know, imagine, um, let's say, 150, 120 to then 450 people was um, the content or the, the context where I'm at um, to make them somehow do something and you see something which you want to do, but you might not be right getting there. So a bumpy road to agility. It's a little bit of success already because you see it's still a road to agility. So somehow um, this is uh, what we're talking about. You know, there's some good ending to the story. Well, stations of the trip. It's about Elios Phobos Katardis, I guess who was in school knows that's the typical Greek tragedy being set up like this and I added a panic stasi, so rethinking. So those are the step of my trip I want to take you through. So the highest form of knowledge is rethinking. This is what I wanted to set up as a motto in the beginning because really the last two years made me learn a lot and rethink a lot, change some perspectives I had, and yeah, come to some insights. So where I'm at, as I said, it's a travel journey, it's a logbook, which you see here. Um, you see my feet on top of a mountain in Norway. That's when I get the call, I've been asked to join a project with several coaches um, to help implementing or continue, whatever, um, safe in a bigger environment. That means um, safe processes as the destination, right? Approved agile ways of working, clear understanding um, of the roles and of course of artifacts, events and all this stuff, you know that. So in the scaled agile framework, also the solution and ask have to be set up or improved of um, the ways of how they are set up and in the end, of course, to be able to deliver better. Um, then the crew in the logbook, you always have to write who's the crew, front, up, front, the um, real travel. Um, it's first six, then ten agile coaches, which we are from one place, sort of. Um, we go in, and first there was another lead coach that was a little bit too dogmatic, got out right away because we had a big clash, and it happens that I'm the skipper then from there on. Um, context is software development um, in a sort of startup environment. It's not really because it's um, belonging to a corporate background, but it's the first time they do software as a company, um, starting with a 450 size um, com people company first, and then in two years scaling up to 7,000 people, including, of course, external suppliers. Uh, means that is a big size startup, and you can imagine that our pains are not only coming from introducing SAFE. Well, SAFE, that was something, you know, they told me, okay, it's a cool project, it's SAFE, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> I know the title, I know what it means, haven't done it. And also I know that all the serious agile coaches are always bashing on SAFE, so can I do this, you know, what happens if I talk about it and, you know, Will I be still a serious agile coach? But exactly, um, I was hoping for in that year to have a bigger, larger project to work together with other agile coaches. So I said, less, yes, why not doing it? I looked into the big picture here, as you can see. I was like, okay, I'm trained and somehow experienced in all these parts of that. So why not do it? First step, PT, Elios, means, okay, I have to leave that here, sorry. Um, this is the moment you get into a company and you feel this pity with a company as a natural coach. You see all the needs they have, the pains they have. And like, okay, I'm here to solve to solve your problems, to help you um, feeling better and so on. So somehow, a very lofty um, place where we take our view from as agile coaches, really kindly bowing down to those below and trying to help them until we might learn some other perspective and be a little bit more humble. Well, and what is the first goal is to help set up a next Agile release train. As an Agile coach, um, I have now two teams. My role as Agile coach then, um, they already use some sorts of, um, yeah, you can say some sort of Scrum. So all those buzzwords are there, like dailies, retros, um, they have Scrum Master, and they have a PO, um, but 
um, they have problems in knowing what their scope is, what they really have to work at because they do the update of the update. Um, and um, yeah, that's one of the problems. And then um, it's, as I said, a really interesting environment where we're at. And I find out very soon that all those buzzwords are nice to have, but it's more a buzzword than it's like really what I was hoping for. So first off, uh, my work was to um, work more like a scrum master because the scrum master in place, I think, did the certification last night. So I had to help a little bit how to do that work. <laughs> and then um, also, <laughs> also um, what happens is that um, the PO, of course, has several teams. The PO is also the PM of the new art and also because they have a super um, solution, which is a solution above the solution, which is an extra thing here. They also pledged for SAFE um, to, to make a change to the framework. Well, that didn't happen yet. Um, so he's doing also the writing epics for that a level. So it's kind of a little bit stretch here with my PO um, or PM, whatever you name it. And then also, um, yeah, I realized that uh, they do retros, but they feel strange. And until then, I realized, okay, they do real retros at the external supplier. And what they do here is just for us, you know, for us, the PO and me, like we do retros. And I ha you, you have the feeling there's no blood in it, you know, that something is wrong. And, you're, and then I ask uh, one guy, what are you doing here really? Like, yeah, I'm the project lead. I'm like, okay, so you do the budgets of your teams you're selling to us, um, please. <laughs> I explained Scrum to him why he is not really part of the team and well, he thinks I'm inviting him to go out of the door. I'm just explaining, you know, very friendly. So he's not part of the retro so next time. So uh, some improvements. Well, we do a lot at the same time. So we bring them like um, trying to, to make sure how they work together because they have problems in working together. Like items are very big from one person working and they were small from the other one and so on. So we do all this sort of stuff. We get on with that a little bit. We Define process even if we have no real requirements because using them as experts saying like you're an expert so you might know what you what you need basically and then we wait for the requirements to drop in. Um, it's, it's more concept work so um, concept team that we have there in the beginning. Well. So far, so good. We do our first PI planning and I have very good PM, so he's also up for all those things you need to do. So he says like, okay, how do we prioritize? Um, I did this before, the way to shout a job, job first, let's do it. So we even do that. We come in with cost of delay, so we said like, cool, that's a really good um, service classes. That's very good. I'm going to use that for the risk. So we bring the PMO um, consultant people to use cost of delay instead of their whatever one to three risk thingy. Um, that's cool. That's really cool. At the same time, first things happen is that, of course, you can imagine I have to work with my PM to set up the art. And actually, he really does not have so much time. So I get in the beginning, we start to work a bit with each other. And then I get less and less time from him because also more and more people are joining our art and the teams. And it's getting really hard to work with him already. So, but before I have to solve that problem, we have sort of the day two is of course a second phase. That means day two, I wake up, it's the next day sort of, we have January now. I wake up and from two teams, we have suddenly 18 teams and two PMs. So there was some sort of situation, a decision. Actually I had, was waiting for my contract. So I was back in, in January, I came back 18 teams and like, wow, okay. I really like challenges. I really like those areas where I have many teams. I'm good with many people. I like groundwork, like when you can, you can see so much when you do something, you know. I really, have, but that was quite a challenge as, as well because those um, teams were not yet been teams before. So they were just freshly formed into the 16 teams. We had two already, 60 more teams. They did not work with Scrum. They did not all work with boards. We did not have any Scrum Masters. I had a second PM. That one did not have time either. Um, so I, my first help was that I found out that he's good in having a telephone call in the evening. This is how we did you know, work in the beginning. Um, felt good in the beginning. So there was a lot of things I had to do at the same time, of course, with so many people. Um, yeah, so we wanted to bring them together because they should have the same back end in the end, which I didn't get. So to make sure they build one backend together, we wanted to bring them one art. Yeah, but if your PMs don't have time, 
but for you, they also don't have time for the other PM and how to bring an art together if you can't bring the PMs together. So what to do? So what I did, I, I booked a co-working space and I just put ourselves all in that room. So we had all meetings, but we could see each other, feel each other, smell each other, touch each other. And uh, we would see when the other one would have some minutes free and we would go for lunch. And, you know, I really set them up as a, you know, I didn't get money for that. But, well, yeah, so to make them start at least recognizing each other and working with each other. And helped, it helped, although they, of course, they have uh, had like several topics because they were both strong PMs and uh, they had uh, been, of course, responsible for the part of the product already and there had been work done already. So we needed to bring the back end together and of course it's a lot of work but we could we were good at that and what happens is that my two first teams were now the like they were totally agile 100 percent now for me because i had so much work to do with the other ones so what i was doing then i had to do the next pi planning with 18 teams they have been newly started as team as this 16 teams like two weeks ago so we used the first pi sprint to get ready instead of waiting to get ready, we used it to, to become ready. And that was, of course, then all very hands-on, um, using Miro to be like in the simplest version, doing PI planning, it's a good and template you have there, setting up, um, first of all, the meetings to be able to be hybrid as well, to have um, on-site meetings and places, you know, and all this stuff, um, communication channels, confluence page to make people find each other and so on, because we had really a big problem there, because we have so many external suppliers and the compliance rules in Germany are really strict. I read them through, I was just laughing because it's really like um, someone sat down to write a um, pamphlet on how to make sure you cannot work with each other. And <laughs> so, and especially, you know, you, you're not allowed to, to bring them in one room, not and so on. So it was really hard, but so that was a very good, um, astonishing success in the end because mm, the goal was to somehow come up with planned items and we really had objectives in the end, we really had features were planned and that was cool. Before that, we had to uh, make sure that we have the uh, same understanding of our issue types because they were just upside down in between. Um, so stories and tasks were interchanged and things like that, um, all this done. So that was hand work, uh, really hands-on work. That was fine, that felt good, that felt like doing something, um, seeing something um, cool. Well, Phobos, fear, next up. That felt good, we were somehow giving in some seeds to grow, but it takes until we see what you grow. And the time in between really felt not very good. Um, although I was told I will get some Scrum Masters now, which I then get, I will be getting soon, um, it really felt like I couldn't get into meetings, I couldn't get contact with the PMs, I wouldn't see any changes. It was just too many teams and, you know, all of this. And, um, yeah, so that was feeling really bad in between. I had the feeling they would not understand what a RTE, okay, I forgot to say, <laughs> I had become the RTE now, um, interims RTE sort of. Um, so they would not understand that they needed to uh, include me in process to be able to help. They would always say like, oh, it's just technical stuff, you don't have to come. Um, yeah, so it felt really bad. So I called my PM then, I knew already, you know, you know, I didn't take that time usually, but this time again, I called him in the evening and said, okay, I'll be there. He's also living in Berlin, which was a good part. I'll be in 40, 50 minute, 45 minutes at your place, or around his place somewhere. I get you, we go for a drink, we have to talk. So we sat down and that was really a turning point. Um, because although we had now the new Scrum Masters arriving, um, which was a task for itself, having new Scrum Masters and bring them in into your context, because it's really hard to get in that context online, to understand where we are and understand like um, who is who and to get contacts and get into invitations. So meeting invitations and emails, whatever, are like gold in that context then. Um, so first up, it was good to have the first um, Scrum Master arrive. You see her feet. It was really good teamwork, but really we felt then soon um, there's a lot of things we have to work on and try to really get contact with the people. And then I went to my, um, where's my PM to have that talk in the evening. We had a beer together and then he would explain me and say, like, <laughs> I was like, you know, I, I can't do anything for you if you let, don't let me and so on, right? 
and then he would go like, okay, actually, um, relax, just give up to try to control anything here. I mean, he was talking to me, I'm, I'm an agile coach, so he was talking to me, the one who's like quite able to, you know, teach on how to, to behave in such environments. So, like yesterday, I could tell what to do, but obviously I couldn't solve the problem either. Um, and then say like, just stop to try to control. I am not controlling it either. I just try to, to somehow stay connected to all the process and exactly for the people. And he told me, just do what you do. It's right what you do. So what was I doing? I was asking like, but what is it? What you mean? What's, what's good what I'm doing? He said like, yeah, what you do is actually, you just connect with the people. And by that, you give them a feeling of belonging. And also, you give, um, uh, you sort of bring people together because I was collecting a lot of information and interconnecting uh, the people with each other. And also um, trying by that, of course, with several different people. Like it could be a PO, it could be a team member, it could be a PM. And um, also being asked outside of my art to help with like conflicting situations and so on. It would be like more POs, more PMs in the solution and teams in the solution. It was that I then um, was able to somehow yeah, get into contact and tackle the problems or the needs from different um, places, so a hundred different places. Um, and that he said, yeah, just go on with that. That's what we need, like being, being somehow reminded at different places and levels all the time to improve and also to create that sense of like positive energy and of this like belonging and we do this together and we can do it, we can go, um, tackle it and solve uh, the things we need to solve and deliver. So therefore that is what's what he said. Um, we started doing lots of things like um, <laughs> realizing POs would work with POs but wouldn't work so much with their teams so try to make them sh um, realizing it's also important to work with that team, the external suppliers so not the over the fence thing. Um, we started like finding out with the work system topology which we, which we did, um, which meetings we really need at which cadence and we realized yeah, POs weren't invited to one meeting for example, a very important one because the meeting was there of historic reasons and things like that. So all these things you might do yourself or know or whatever we did. Um, we had a wonderful on-site PI planning, which was very good for connecting people. People would come from India, from China, so seeing each other the first time. So it was good to do that. And um, yeah, this moment of turning point was sort of the catharsis. So um, what happened then was we had this talk and I would stop trying to be in control, stay connected and just follow on at that approach. And in that moment, I realized this is more like not a linear approach, but more network approach, which I was going to, to do. I started it because I felt a little bit bored and not invited to all the processes. But in the end, the feedback from my PM was that it was just helping and it was helping not just the art, but the whole solution. And that's important because, uh, as the name says already, we try to cut the value stream, of course, in that way that we are delivering on one solution. And therefore, it makes sense to stop optimizing locally and try to optimize the whole flow you see the elephant in the room, so I tried to tackle the elephant um, wherever I could in different ways. Now having Scrum Masters, that was a good time, having others to um, multiply what we were doing, um, and that was good in that way. Well, um, and then somehow the feedback must have been not just been seen by the PM. So the journey went on that I brought in another RTE. She would be more on details. She would follow up on all the risk process and really go dearly for every single risk that I brought in because I knew that's important point now. Um, and for me, I was asked then from the solution management to, to join the solution, to set up the solution. That was really cool. I mean, it could feel, felt good in the beginning to be told, that, come on, join us, you know, you're doing good. Uh, the problem was I did not really have one sponsor. I had several sponsors and it was between safe organizations. So like the solution management and the STE, they wanted to have me. But on the other hand, they also had, of course, their organizational structure. And um, it wasn't clear who's giving me sort of my orders or who really wanted what from me and what was my role. So I had like, again, a bumpy um, road here. Um, always asking like, come on, I want to do something. I want to help give me something to do and, uh, you know, again, make me part of your process and, well, 
as a problem of the solution was, of course, also that they wouldn't coordinate very well with each other. That was, I was a symptom for that exactly. And yeah, um, then it ended um, with a rethinking, with ending with uh, that rethinking picture is actually showing like every, all the small flows are coming together in the river mouth to then be only recognized as a river um, and bringing maybe agile waters to run. Um, and um, yes, so this approach was like the network approach was one rethinking and the other rethinking was because of, I was then asked to join a team which would be sitting at the solution level and they would do the work actually the, we would yeah, theoretically want to have the solution to do. Um, so they would do like all the strategic work and like really um, working on the content, working on KPI framework, working on measurements, uh, starting to do, to do the reporting, uh, you know, th set that up and all this stuff. And I realized already when I was searching for my role at the solution level that um, I would then um, yeah, have them working on the content where I wanted to have that, that content as a vehicle to work with the solution. And so therefore I was always like, they had, they had the responsibility, I had to do it. So they asked me then to join the team and that was really the second part of the rethinking because it made me realize um, to get closer to the real work we are doing. So I got closer to the problem, closer to the topics because I was working with them and the team, but I was still the agile coach, um, not so very well recognizable from outside by a position or something anymore, but I was in the heart of um, setting up the solution suddenly, um, being able to work with them using the same vehicle um, and always triggering them with like, okay, if you set up KPIs, you know, you want to measure, but you might want to measure also your objectives and key results. Or if you set up your business capability framework, um, everyone misunderstands that first because of SAFE, but that's really something to break down like the strategy and something we want to be able to deliver on. And then if you want to do that, you have to make sure how to really implement it and connect it. And then also a good part about that was really, um, they also had to bring um, or design a re, uh, requirements um, management process. And that's really where um, a good part come along with because they were designing this process and they said, okay, let's have all our requirements also in a dryer service desk. And I was giving them then the idea of, okay, yay, we have a coordination level. Let's really use this for um, coordinating and being able to make decisions strategically um, connected all through our way down to the implementation to make sure we're really delivering also on our strategy, not just on any random features which we had before. So um, that's where we are now. So we are having now features. We are having um, start to have capabilities, not at every place yet, um, but they're connected now to the first epics. And um, we use this Jira service desk now as a process, as a Kanban board. And now the next step is to also bring in OKRs, not as a framework, but as a context, a content. And to use then agile measurements and flow metrics to go on with that. So um, as you can see, the new perspective is get closer to it, really work with the people, add agility directly, interlink it directly with it, come down from your agile clouds and um, also use this network approach to let agility or improvements, uh, you don't even have to call it maybe agility, improvements evolve through in that part of organization where you are. And um, yes, make sure to deliver together with everyone um, on a bigger perspective instead of local optimization. That's it, competencies, be a bit crazy, do it anyway, be creative, it's me, it's not very long ago, it's really me. Um, and um, yeah, stop, <laughs> stop now. <laughs> so, mastery, <laughs> so get on the, be a captain, find your um, environment and do your na mastery of navigation um, and use your competencies for that. Point. <laughs>